Good afternoon, everybody. Well, good afternoon in Ontario anyway. Yeah, I guess it's afternoon pretty much everywhere in Canada right now. Good evening in France. Yes, and it's evening in France. And, uh, and Floris has come away from a, a wedding in order to join us, not his own. He's been married some time. But <laughs> so as people come in, as you know, I do a little patter. I don't have a I don't have a joke, Kim Chen. <clears throat> oh, uh, maybe you do, Floris. If you've got a wine related joke, we usually start with that. So keep start thinking about that and then I'll do a little introduction. And then none of my jokes are PG, uh, Michael. Oh, yeah, well then, well, that's okay. No, don't <laughs> <on that. laughs> we were We were actually at a, at a really neat uh, wine dinner last night at Pearl Moore set in Niagara last night with a bunch of Opinion members. There were 88 seats and uh, it was a really neat, neat evening. So, um, all right, well, I think we should get started because it's already two minutes past the hour. As, as we've said, it's, uh, it's evening for Floris in France and it's... Uh, different um, times across Canada for everybody else here. Um, I, I haven't done one of these in a while, I've noticed, is that uh, I'm, I'm a little rusty. I didn't have a joke ready, I got nothing. But, uh, but I think that actually this might be a, a family of winemakers that needs no introduction, but I'm gonna introduce them anyway. Uh, you'll see on one of your screens is Floris Lemstra, who has been just a fantastic partner of Opimian for many, many years now. I have many, many, many of his wines here in my cellar. And I was just telling him before we came on that I've actually got a 2015 Minervois. So that's a seven-year-old wine. And I tell you, it's as fresh as a daisy. It's, uh, I've got a, a, a Riedel glass that's specifically for this uh, varietal or this, this blend. And so I kept the label on it just for everybody to see. So, so new glassware, uh, seven-year-old wine, I'm in seventh heaven. And I and so so Floris is now or for a long time has been making uh, wines as Chateau Canet, and then his daughter Charlotte decided to get into the biz and she's making Fleur de Charlotte on the property. If I, I'll let you get into that, Floris, and then if I'm not mistaken, your son is making wines now too, which I got to savor one of his wines uh, when I was there visiting you guys. Which uh, I'm going to try and find the video so that I, it's only like a 15 second video. Hopefully, I can show that as well. But so uh, over to you, Mr. Lemstra, I would love you to talk a little bit about your family and where you are right now, and obviously a bit of tasting of the wines that are in the offering this year. Well, thank you for, uh, for that uh, introduction, Michael. So I am sitting in my cellar. Um, the noise you hear is, it's, um, I'll show you what the noise is. It's my two dogs that I have to, they're running in the cellar. So these are my two Weimaraners. And the reason that they are here playing in front of the press and the vats and everything is that because my son, Oliver, who's also one of our winemakers, he's in the vineyards right now, um, um, trying to um, save our crop from wild boar, which um, I'm sorry for the non-hunters among you, but we have a lot of, um, lot of problems with, uh, with um, boar eating our grapes. So Oliver is, uh, is out there looking after that. And so we need to keep the dogs inside. So if you have a little bit of noise, that's, that's because you know, we're trying to save this year's crop, right? Um, so yes, it's a big family affair. I'm sitting in a cellar. We have uh, Chateau Canet, which is a place that we purchased 16 years ago after having lived in, in Burgundy for another 16 years. So yeah, I'm always in France. I'm Dutch by origin. And I moved to Burgundy in um, 91. And in 95, I met my wife and I married her. We got engaged two months after we met in this vineyard in Merceau. And here we are in, in the vineyards in the Minervois. 26 years later, it's quite amazing. Um, and um, so having- It's that romantic the, a place, is it for us? That it only Burgundy, took two months. Burgundy, Burgundy is pretty romantic. <laughs> so we literally met in, in the vineyards um, and she was working for this Canadian travel company actually called Butterfield and Robinson in, uh, in, in Toronto. And um, I was working in the wine business and we got married and 15 years later, we decided we wanted to set up shop 
on her own and travel and tourism combined with, with wine. And we find this vineyard in the south of France um, where we have, so we have 10 cottages and the reason why she's not here right now um, together with Charlotte, who's, who's working with her because we've got this wedding going on literally on the other side of the door here. There's, I think something like 120 English people uh, celebrating uh, on our front lawn. Um, uh, while Oliver is uh, is trying to save a crop, so you say everybody is uh, it's 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 a real family affair. And I'm and sitting for, in Flores, there. I'm going to interrupt you again. Is that I saw a really good wild boar recipe on Food Network this morning. So if you need one, let me know. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> well, I'll, listen, I mean, there there it's it's Oliver with a buddy there behind the cellar, and we had a whole troop of wild boar eating our grapes. So he he, he gets he gets really annoyed. So I think he's out there. So if you hear a loud bang, then. That means that we are having a big barbecue tomorrow, um, but it's all very sustainable, right? so trust me. But um, anyway, so yeah, so we, we've arrived here in, in 2007, so 15 years ago. Canet, Chateau Canet was, was owned by then by a large um, sort of multinational and, 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 and was actually used for making the base wines of, of branded wines. And so we, we took it over and renovated it, and it was it was a good basic, but it needed a huge amount of TLC, and, and, and which is what we did, and, and and we created we recreated the brand, we recreated the center, we built a whole new part. So if, um, here, so so where we're here now, so this is the old cellar where you have the concrete vats and the wooden vats, but then I'll show you around. Um, so we, we built this cellar here, um, which is quite a lot more modern, where we have more more storage capacity. And we also, I'm not sure how far I can go with my Wi-Fi, but um, then also we, we put in place our our bottling bottling cellar, which is bottling line, sorry, I should say. Um, let me see if I can turn on lights. So here we, we bottle all our wines here. So you're getting a, a live tour. And so everything is bottled here. I'm keeping an eye on my, are you still hearing me, Michael? Yeah, yeah, no problem okay. at all. Yeah. Awesome. So we have our we have our bottling line, which is small, but extremely high end. So it's got all the bills and we work with nitrogen to reduce our, nitrogen is a, is a, is a really awesome way to reduce the levels of, um, of sulfide because obviously nitrogen is an inert gas. Uh, here's a little bowl of wine, I guess. Um, nitrogen is an inert gas that um, we inject in the bottle before bottling it. And, um, you know, obviously when the wine falls in a bottle, which is full of air, it, it, it oxidizes. Whereas we use um, um, nitrogen to eliminate that air from the bottle. And then, you know, when the wine falls into a bottle with no air, you don't need to preventative add sulfites um, to, um, to, to, to limit the oxidation. So, so I mean, it's, it's a cellar that has been, so we've spent the last 15 years really to, um, yeah, to, to, to modernize it, to, to reposition it in the market. And then um, it started to grow and um, we needed to uh, look at different vineyards and we had this <clears throat> Sorry, we had this um, inkling for for Pinot and, and Chardonnay, and um, so Pinot oh, and Noir. Is, is just so you know, Floris, we're we're, we're still seeing the bottling line, and but it's not. Although we have at the property, probably have twenty hectares that are not planted, but that are rotating vineyards that are being ripped up, vineyards being replanted. So we always have about twenty hectares that are that are free, but we never planted Pinot Noir because it's not the right climate for, for Pinot Noir. We're in the south of France. Pinot Noir is an extremely elegant, delicate grape. Um, and um, although I love it, I love it. I, I wouldn't plant it at Chateau Canet because it's just not right. Um, so we've been looking and looking and it has driven us towards the, um, the Pyrenees, the Pyrenees Mountains, which are, so the foothills of the Pyrenees are only 45 minutes from here. And so we, we, we found this small vineyard so in 2018, um, which is also what I said. Can you, can you hear um, me, so we, Floris? We, we bought, 
can, can you hear me? Acres in the foothills of, 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 of the Pyrenees, which is much, much higher than, than we are here at Chateau Canet. So Canet is at 80 meters above sea level. And in the Pyrenees, we're at 400 meters above sea level. And, and that difference really gives the mildness of climate. Oh, is my, oh, there you go. I think my, my camera just stopped. Yeah, and, and so we're not able to see you. Am I back again? No, not yet. And and since you were in the bottling room, Michael, that's, can you hear me? I can hear you, but I don't think you can hear me. And can the others? Uh, Am I still there? Can everybody hear Floris, but they can't see Floris? Is that correct? Thanks, Barb. Yeah, and Brendan, and Ken. Um, so Floris, we can we can hear you, but we can't see you. Um, and he can't hear me, obviously. <laughs> so, um, can you? Uh, are you still there? I seem I to can, be. Yeah. I seem to be gone. Oh dear. I'm going to see if I can get a hold of him another way, everybody, so that he can go out and come back in because uh, it should it should work. Sorry, everybody, just uh, your patience. And Kim Chen, have you got anything you can do from your end? Hello. Yeah, uh, can you hear us, Flores? No, I think, uh, is, do you have another way of getting a hold of Flores, Kim Chen? Can you try and uh, text him or email him, please? Yes, I will. Okay, thanks. And like I said, I have no jokes. I'm not so sure if you can hear me, guys. Yeah. Um, I'll let him sure speak. I seem to be well connected. Um, I can continue to talk about my story in uh, in Limu. So we we got these um, these vineyards in Limu in 2018 because they were so. Domendo Oliver, um, we. Um, we bought these vineyards to, to make Pinot Noir and, and it was a perfect, perfect match. So we created Domendo with, um, with Oliver, my son, who was also a little bit of a, um, uh, a way of connecting him um, with his roots because Oliver was born in Burgundy. He was actually born in Hospice de Bonne which is a, you know, one of the landmarks in, um, in, uh, in Burgundy. And then he grew up in, um, he grew up in, in, in the south of France. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of a mix of his, of his um, Burgund Burgundian upbringing and his, his, um, his, his southern French roots where we, where we connected him with the, the vineyards in Limoux. And so that, that, is, um, that has been a really fun project over the last uh four years and so that has been our second second event oh i can see you now michael are you there uh good and now i can see you too so that's oh, excellent. there you go and and we've heard you all along but but we couldn't see you for the last five minutes or so all right i'm, I'm not sure what happened i mean we're supposed to be on fiber so but we're still in the sort of in the vineyard somewhere i mean my closest neighbor is two miles away so it's 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 still sometimes a little dodgy and, anyway and i i have so, a burning question about where you were though with the bottling line and i saw the bottles are you still are you having any trouble getting glass or have you got enough for this year it's it's a huge issue so to give you an idea is normally we would buy um we would buy glass directly from the um glass Factory. Yeah, Factory. Factory. So, which is actually an American company called OI, Owens International, which is the, the biggest glass manufacturer in the world. Uh, Owens Corning, right? Is that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, we, we buy directly from them. They have factories all over France and Spain. And um, so, their logistics, the way they were set up is that we normally would buy a minimum of seven pallets and we would be delivered within a week, really. Um, so now we, first of all, we have had a 25% price hike and, um, and not, not to be discussed. There was no, no discussion. 
It's mm-hmm. just the way it is. And instead of buying seven pallets mixed of different bottles, Burgundy, Bordeaux, whatever not, we now have to buy full trucks per bottle. And if you're lucky, you get delivered three months later. Wow. So from a logistical perspective, so our stock, I was actually out, out in, the, in the yard behind the cellar I just showed you. It was all over this afternoon. Because so we're normally, so if you have a, a bottling of rosé at the end of your season, a pallet of glass is about 1,600 bottles. So, um, you know, at the end of the season, I might need three or four pallets of, of white Bordeaux bottles with screw cap. But if I want those now, I need to order 26 bags. This is the way it is. So that's 40,000 bottles. So, I mean, we're lucky because on the back of COVID, where thanks to companies like Opinion, where, where we've, we resell a lot of our wine through um, what they call DGC, direct, direct to consumer, like, like with Opinion, which is the kind of business we favor because it's a lot more direct, it's a lot more interesting for the consumer. Um, so we've done actually quite well throughout COVID, um, but then now our traditional more on-trade, so restaurant, hotels, wholesale companies, customers that had suffered during COVID, they're coming back. So our, our business is actually doing quite quite well, um, but now we, we are sitting on the stock. I probably, as we speak, I'll probably have 500,000 bottles empty sitting in the back of my yard. And uh, I was walking with Oliver this afternoon and they're stacked up, obviously, and you know, a couple of pallets, like two or three pallets have fallen over. So it's like 4,000 4, bottles so because it's, it's super hot. It's 38 degrees right now. Um, and so I haven't got any space to put it inside. It's standing outside. It's all filmed and stuff like that. But obviously, with sun, that 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 shrink wrap cooks a little bit, and that's it's yeah. No, to answer your question, Michael, it's it's a huge issue. It's a huge mm-hmm. issue. But it's but and for and fortunate or unfortunate, it's not a problem of getting the glass. It's the problem of having to have too much of it. And now you've got seven years worth of glass on the property. <laughs> yeah. like, you better problem. start ordering some serious yeah. That's guys. right. I you heard that, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you know what? I mean, we're lucky that, that 10 years ago, we decided that we should work directly with the producers and we've made the right choice and they, they honor their, and they're, you know, are they, are they, benefiting or sort of using the situation to readjust their 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 structure their supply chain and their 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 logistics probably and you know what can you blame them i mean demand is is exceeding the offer at the moment so yeah they're saying okay you know what we're 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 that's 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 the good good rule of capitalism so I'm not I'm not complaining, but it's it's um yeah I mean to to get, guarantee a smooth supply to our customer base we need to sit on invest stuff. in that yeah but the the problem is that at the same time the 2021 harvest was majorly um uh, how do you say affected by the frost period that we had in um uh, in April last year so a lot of the 2021 wines were in short supply. So as we were actually doing really well, as I said earlier, throughout COVID, our demand was actually going up. So we needed to secure great purchases to make sure that we had enough. So we have, okay, just to finish the story. So we have Chateau Canet, we have Domendo, and then we buy grapes for, for our wine, like for Dolores Charlotte. So, um, oh, hang on. I just see a beautiful dog. Yes, Brendan's dog. That's right. Brendan, what's the dog? <laughs> Mom, come here. Look at this dog, Mom. <laughs> hey. Hey. Oh, don't let him go away. <laughs> look, look at it. Nelson. What dog is that, Brendan? The Weimaraner. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. and you. You're muted, Brendan. Yeah, I got two of them right here. 
Okay, Floris, let's talk about some wine, man. That's right, what, you, so. what you got in your glass there. Okay, so so um, I just went, and I can't go out there because I know I'll, I'll lose the, um, the reception, but so you see all these barrels behind me, and uh, at the end, the far end over there, there are some barrels of um, of alternative. So it's um, as I said, it's it's nine thirty here in the evening. So I thought I could yeah you know, treat myself to something uh, uh, nice, and it is um, it's basically a wine that was born about ten years ago. Um, bit of a mistake. So you see these big big concrete uh, tanks that are, you know, that we use to, to vinify, um, vinify Chardonnay and, 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 and other wines. And at one stage I said, I should just add a tiny little touch of, um, of, of oak to, to our Chardonnay, like 15, 20%. And so I bought 10 new barrels like this. And I put them down and I put in Chardonnay, um, juice. So I vinified the Chardonnay in those barrels like I used to do in Merceau because I ran a company in Merceau um, uh, for about five years when I was living in Burgundy. And so it's, it's a bit of a, you know, a thing for me. I, I love a good Burgundy Chardonnay. And, and so I, I made 10 barrels, which is 3,000 bottles of, um, of, of a Burgundy style Chardonnay that I was going to blend to these big tanks to just add a tiny little bit of um, oak flavor to the height of about 15, 20% to my, my big um, tank of Chardonnay. And then in, in July, pretty much this time of the year, my cellar master came and see me and, and said, Forrest, what are you, what are you doing with this, with this Chardonnay? I said, well, it's going into the tank. And then he said, well, the tank of Chardonnay has been bottled, sold, and you know, it's not no longer there. I said, oh. I think I think the French word I used at the time was like merde. So, <laughs> <be now." laughs> so it's it's PG here, yeah. Yeah, PG. <laughs> uh, just, anyway, so um I was like, oh dear. I said it was totally my my mistake. And and so we went into the cellar and we tasted these these barrels with our analogists. And um, you know, so we have Two enologists in house, one consulted enologist to kind of take our head out of the sand when we think something is delicious. But it's like wine is also a little bit like children, right? So you, your children are always beautiful and intelligent, but not everybody in the world is beautiful and intelligent. So sometimes you need someone from the outside to tell you that your child is actually quite ugly and doesn't smell very nice. So we always get an outside consultant to taste with us. To really act like um, uh, we say in French a garde fou, uh, someone who who prevents us from from being it keeps you bad. honest essentially. Yeah, yeah. It's from having blinkers blinkers on, right? Yeah, it's it's actually quite interesting to to do that. And anyway, so plus our cellar master, and then and there then there's me who's probably a little bit more in line with the market. And I was tasting that, and especially with my burgundy. So we were tasting this, this wine from the barrel. It's like, what are we going to do with it? And I was tasting it from the barrel and I was saying, yeah, this is, this is like what I used to make in, in Merceau in Burgundy, right? This is, and, and one of the things I remember moving down to the south of France is that it was almost, not people are not ashamed, but they're not super forthcoming. In Burgundy, when you go out for dinner, everybody's talking about, you know, I've made this and you should try this. And it's not to boast, it's just really to share this super proud of whatever they whatever they've made. And, and, and the wines they make in Burgundy are, are, are beautiful. But in the south of France, which is a very large wine producing region, they were a little bit more modest and they were a little bit more timid about their wines and you know, and and not not that much force coming in. And I was thinking that, you know, this is is so much a way to show off. The potential of this this wine region, where you know we have nothing to to feel ashamed about in the south of France, it's the biggest wine region in the world, guys. This is two hundred and fifty thousand hectares. It is a potential of about two billion 
um, bottles a year. But there's some really beautiful terroir because diversity is, is humongous. Anyway, so we, we, we said, I, I, said I, I said at the time when we were chasing it together, I said, this is like an alternative to burgundy. And then they said, well, what are you going to do with it? I said, well, I'll just bottle it as it is, straight from barrel, and I'll call it alternative, just also to poke a little bit of a finger in the eye of my Burgundian friends, which is always lovely. And, um, and so we've been doing this for, so our mistake has grown into one of our most successful wines. So last year, this wine um, was elected. So there's a tasting in, 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 in um, it's actually done in England, but um, so they choose the, the top 100 wines of, um, of the Languedoc. And there's no one to 100. It's either you're in it or you're not. And so now, I think this is a tense vintage that we've done it. And it's now in the top 100 wines of the Lodo. Congratulations. It shows, it shows the potential of the region. And, um, and, and, and I think the potential of the region, but also you know, the future of the region, because there's an extraordinary value for money. So this is a wine, I'm not sure what it's sold for in, in your catalog right now, but it's probably going to be half the price or less than that. Than a um, uh, a Merceau or or high high rate yeah value. of of a, a white Burgundy for sure. And but I mean, it, it's from a value for money perspective. This region has so much to um to, to gain. It's it's it's, it's and you you've put it in a three pack wooden case. I yeah, understand. It's small yeah. small. Normally, yeah, and locally we sell it in um in six, and mm -hmm. but we did um we did a three pack um um wooden case. I just see a little blonde goddess coming into the center let me introduce you to Charlotte. you should bring a glass yes that's... which is exactly what she's doing she's been well trained anyway so this is i thought it was it was 9 30 tonight so i thought i should have some alternative and here is charlotte my hi young. charlotte cheers nice to see you i need to go fill up Be better get some oh, wine in that some I was having some alternative, which I like. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to let, let you, Michael, in her capable hands while I'm getting her a glass or something. Because um, just for your for everybody who's on the call, is that Charlotte went to... Um, had, now, Charlotte came to see us, my wife and I, three years ago now, um, saying that she had met this guy and that she was going to Antarctica. And um, we are like... Okay, um, but it, it became quite a project, and 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 I'm sure we will tell you more about it. But it became a project that Opimium had a huge um, um, factor in it. So, um, try to to you. And and the way you put it, Flora, so she met a guy and went to Antarctica, but wasn't to get married, was it, uh, Charlotte? No, no, no. Exactly. Yeah, over to you, Charlotte. I think um, you need a better explanation. <laughs> well, we so I was at a very randomly at a brunch in London um, a couple of years ago, about three years ago, three four years ago now, um, and I saw this man about half an hour after the whole thing started, who pulled up with a bike helmet on, lycra, and a backpack. I was like, oh, that's quite intriguing. Um, so we started talking and introduced myself and asked him where he was going in such a um, such a suit. Thank so you very much. Ooh, yummy. Um, and he was explaining to me that he was actually on his way to Antarctica. Um, and that intrigued me a little bit more. So after talking to him for about an hour, um, I essentially jumped at his opportunity um, to join him on his next expedition to Antarctica which unfortunately was postponed by a couple of years. Um, it was meant to happen in 2020, but actually took place in March this year, so 2022. Um, so delayed about six times, but because of that, it allowed me to really foster and foster relationships and find sponsors or partners, more so, in this um, pretty big journey and opinion is one of those partners and quite a substantial um, substantial presence and a, a 
a group, not company, a group of people that I feel proud to represent um, overall and felt proud to represent while I was there. And I hope that I have a little blog coming out sharing a bit more of the story um, soon, hopefully. So hopefully you'll be able to read that and get a little snippet of what being in Antarctica was like. Um, but essentially we had lectures uh, while on board from experts. We had the head of sustainability from Shell and from Hewlett Packard who were both there telling us about uh, sustainability in the oil industry, which is slightly controversial, but also um, rather essential in our daily. And um, we had the head of sustainability um, with Hewlett Packard talking to us about sustainability in um, technology. And it's interesting to get those aspects from the bigger companies and the bigger industries, but also from every participant on board. So there are about 170 of us from 36 or so different countries. And everyone had their different story to tell and um, expertise to share. And that was part of the, the most amazing thing. Um, and in the evenings, we had these kind of moments called speaker's corners where some of the participants would do exactly that, share their expertise, share what they, they know, um, and most of which had lots to do with sustainability. Um, and that was one of the most interesting moments because you would learn, learning from the, the grit and the determination of everyone on board that wants to have an impact on the planet and a positive one. And that actually, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, we visited some places like Deception Island, which is a real reminder of the negative impact we've had on the planet. Um, and Deception Island is, an island where back in the day um, it was a big center for whaling uh, so they would literally pull up in this island which is um, an old volcano so the crater is actually full of water and you can access it by ship so the whaling ships would go into the crater and it has this massive bay which the whales would be brought up onto shore um, blubber cut off and boiled right there to then send off by the north for us to use um, so it's, you know, you see the ruins of that and then you see the fur seals all over the beach um, and you see whales just outside the island. So it's, it's a stark reminder of the negative impact we had, but also um, an example of the positive rebound that can happen. Um, and I think it's not all doom and gloom. As scary as things like climate change and warming might seem, you know, and for us over here, it feels very real. In the south of France, we're used to warm temperatures, but the summer has been surreal. Um, you know, it's hot, it's muggy. We have forest fires literally across the road. Um, and it really hits home that things are changing. I mean, I grew up here and we never had a water tank outside just in case something happened where we could jump to the emergency and be the first response before the firefighters. Um, and now we do. And it's things like that that you just have to adapt to, but also that is why we need to change the little things. Um, like get an electric car, although that is potentially a big thing. Um, but at the end of the blog, I finished with a little challenge, which I challenge you all to now, which essentially is a one month, a six month and a one year challenge. And for each of those, I challenge you to do something a little bit more sustainable, perhaps out of your comfort zone uh, for a month, then for six months, and then for a year. Um, for me, first month, I'm gonna be very honest, was not buying any new clothes. So I went fully vintage, um, which was actually very fun and it changes your shopping experience. Um, and other things were looking at, you know, potential B Corp certification, not not in this um, context, but more so in my studies and things like that, looking at how, how we can make the bigger impacts in the long lasting ones. Um, and it's exciting. I think it's just a little pinch of sustainability in everything we do. It doesn't have to be big, big changes, but a little bit every now and again, and slowly we'll start to see results, we hope. Um, so I hope I haven't run on for too long, but if you have any questions, mm, do. Not do at shout. all, that, that, that's, that's great, Charlotte. And and uh, the one thing I wanted, how big was that ship? Um, 
It was actually quite large. I can't tell you the dimensions. I should know. Yeah. And how many people on it? So we were 170. Yeah. So so just um, so people can get a sense of, of the scope of this uh, of this expedition, it was big. Yeah, yeah it was a pretty pretty big big um, big guns on there as well. Yeah. Well, we had um, actually the ship is quite cool because you're obviously we're going on a on a sustainable expedition to Antarctica, yet we're taking a big ship there. Um, seems a bit counterintuitive, but the expedition as a whole was actually offset um, 1.25 times. So it was a carbon um, negative, negative uh, exhibition expedition, which is quite mm -hmm. cool. And part of that was because the ship itself is 60% more sustainable than any other ship of its size in the industry um, because it has half of its engines are actually not um, diesel but electric, which is pretty cool for a ship. So it's very modern, new technology. We tested it out in quite literally some of the harder, harshest conditions in the world, um, you know, crossing the Drake's Passage from South America, Shariah, to to uh, Peninsula of Antarctica. You have the two oceans meeting and the swells can get pretty big. So we were on waves of about 10 to 15 meters um, over 20 feet. So it was, yeah, I'm, I'm 20 and I haven't fallen out of bed for a long time. <laughs> um, but I can assure you that crossing the Drake's Passage, I'm not out of bed. And it was not a nice feeling. Um, and it wasn't because you had been drinking rolling. your wine either, was it? No, exactly. No. No, that's, uh, yeah, but I, I have to say that for someone my age, it's wonderful to know that young people such as you are doing things like this to to protect our planet. Thank you very much for doing that. It's really great. Well, thank you to Opinion for, for helping me make it happen. Um, you know, it's it's not just Opinion in the office, it's Opinion as a whole. Um, so it's all of you guys that are enjoying a glass of wine with us right now. Let's drink um, to that. So thank you yeah. very much. For letting me experience that and I hope that the blog gives you a bit of a, an idea what it was like um, and there are some pictures to come as well so I hope that it does inspire you to have an impact as well and and just before you leave and, and go back to serve the guests at the wedding um, would you please just talk a little bit about the the five wines that we have in our top value section which are all happen to be yours and and just a general sense of, of what you were doing as you created this this uh, set of wines. Um, I think the Fleur de Charlotte range is very fun. It's, um, you know, I grew up in the vineyards in the south of France. It's very warm. The grapes get very ripe. So the wines get um, very punchy, but in a very nice way, I think. But it means that it's also fun to contrast that every now and again. And um, I, you know, we're a slightly competitive household over here in the good way. Um, and, you know, I've always been inspired by my dad doing his own thing and my brother also now doing his own thing. And each one of those wines is very different. And so is Felder Charlotte. So we've each gone a different way. And I think the story with Felder Charlotte is that they're trying to do each, um, each bottle is trying to do each different grape variety justice. Um, so, you know, you're bringing out the fruitiness and the elegance, the, the fun and the young in each grape. You're not putting it on oak, it's straight in the stainless steel um, tanks right here. So you're kind of extracting everything that the grape has to have um, and really kind of trying to play with that purity um, and the fruit and hopefully yeah. embodies the young, fun, somewhat elegant, maybe not when I'm this sweaty, um, after serving. But it's, you know, it's a wine that's very drinkable, um, I hope. And I, I went to get uh, one of those bottles. I've, I've got a bunch of canet here with me uh, up here in my office, and I went to get a bottle of yours as well, and they're all gone. That's how drinkable uh, they are. <laughs> uh, Michael, can, I'm sorry, I'd like to interrupt. I'm... Yeah. Fleur de Charlotte, uh, Charlotte, I'm such a big fan of the Fleur de Charlotte. I have the Viognier I've been buying every single year. Uh, and, as, and has it as well. <laughs> and uh, I want to ask you this year, it's uh, the Sauvignon Blanc. It's a new one. 
can you tell me a little bit? Can you share with us what's new about it? And yeah, it's, it's probably it's probably it's actually it's newly selected by by um, my film, but it's a wine actually we've been making um, for uh, for 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 about four years. So it's a vineyard that is now seven years old, and uh, it's funny, you know what? So. I, I poured myself a glass of Chardonnay and I poured Charlotte a glass of Sauvignon because I know she loves it. Um, when we make this wine, it's 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 um, Sauvignon is a technical wine to make, um, especially in south of France. It's it's one of those wines when you can very easily miss the boat. So the the, the, the typical Sauvignon flavors, the the the, the, the gooseberry, the the the, the boxes, the the, the Grapefruit, the zing. the zing of the Sauvignon, exactly. That's what that's what we're looking for, and um, and it's whereas the Chardonnay you want to push it thirteen plus. I always say très couvert, so you need to be over thirteen to have the fattiness, the richness, and also you need to get the aromas out of the skins. Whereas Sauvignon is the opposite. As soon as you ripen it too much, you lose all those all those aromas, and um, so this is a vineyard we planted. Um, yeah, about seven years ago, and so it's it's still young. It's literally just it's behind the center. It's just yeah. just just uh, where we're sitting, uh, not even fifty meters from it. And it's it's now it's really starting to to yeah to to shine. And um, so the first couple of years. So why is it new? The first couple of years we we sold it in blends um, because we didn't feel it was kind of living up to the typicity of the grapes, which is what Charlotte was talking about, which is exactly what we're trying to do with the Fleur de Charlotte range. Um, and, and now for the last couple of years, the, the Sauvignon is really starting to, to shine. It's, it's, it's a cool vineyard. It's, I, I, I don't, so I'm getting myself a glass of Chard. Chardonnay is getting, a, Chardonnay, Chardonnay is getting herself. Oh, it's actually quite fun to try together. It's very different. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm not drinking her, so we yeah. um, so obviously in the same household we all have COVID anyway. So mm. And and um, had COVID, not have COVID. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and speaking of Chardonnay, um, and I want to tell it to the crowd who's here, our master of wine scored highly the Fleur de Charlotte Chardonnay. So mm. I'm getting sorry, Michael, I had to interrupt. I'm I usually always <laughs> get the Viognier, but this year instead of getting another case of the Domendo Chardonnay, which pairs beautifully with butter chicken, I'm going to have the Fleur de Charlotte Chardonnay because the master wine said it, it's a beautiful wine to have. Just don't tell Oliver, that's all. Yeah. He might be a little upset. I, I might have to blow it a little bit. There, there is some friendly competition between the two of you, if I recall. Oliver just came out of the vineyard because it's dark here now, and they were successful in um, protecting our grapes. Excellent. So we're, well we're having more barbecue tomorrow. Yes, that's great. And I, All right. I have, to, I have to go and carve up a wild boar right now. Where well, and, and before but, you but do that, Flora. We're Flores. the view near that was right out front because actually we went for a walk the other day and the vineyards are, it's great when you can kind of snack while you walk on the little grapes. It's nice and zingy acidity. Mm. Uh, that's lovely. nice. But uh, maybe if, if anybody has any questions on the wine, uh, this would be perfect perfect time to, to talk about wines that people have discovered in the in the catalog and they might want to know more about it. Yeah, let's just talk about the pick pool for a moment. I know it's painful to talk about, but let's talk yeah. about why there's uh, so little of it available. Well, basically, I talked a little bit about the frost in, uh, in, in April last year. and It, it hit the grapes that, that um, grow earlier. So, so your reds are always a little bit late. So when we're starting to harvest later this month, we'll start with um, the Sauvignon, as I said earlier, something to be harvested early. Um, and then we'll go on to uh, Chardonnay, Viognier, a bit of a rosé, Merlot, and so forth. So the reds, so when we start maybe in the last week of August for, for the Sauvignon, we probably won't start with the Grenache or the Syrah until the last week of September. So obviously these grapes, they sprout at different different periods and, and Picpoo is, is a very early, early grape. And um, 
when we had, it was the 7th of April last year, and we had minus five. And um, so we were making fires in the morning um, to, to have a smoke screen. We use hay bales to, to project smoke over the, over the vineyard. And because it's, it's normally the coldest moment of the, of the night, it's actually just before sunup. So at that time of the day, it's around 6.30 close to seven and then you know you can walk out at five and you I always pull my hand over the windscreen of my car and it's wet with the dew and at six o'clock it's wet at 6 30 it's solidly frozen and um and it's crazy but then on the 7th of April it wasn't at six six seven o'clock in the morning at two o'clock in the morning it was minus five and at that stage you just there, there's nothing you can do it was just, it was just, so we lost 80% of our big food. Uh, it's sad. It's, uh, um, and you know, it, it just goes to show that you really are at the, at the very beginning. It's a, you're farming, right? You're a farmer. Oh, we're right. So, right. You go at the yeah. message of the nature, so, right? If it's sunny, it's sunny. If it's no rain, then you have no rain, which yeah. is supposed to get comfy. It is what it is, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a and and Floris, Greg, Greg is asking about the uh, Victoria favorite Chardonnay. Is that in Burgundian oh. style as well? No, it's not actually. <clears throat> um, so the, the, the thing about Burgundian, again, so I'm surrounded by these women that tell me all the time that they know better, and 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 and, and, and then they 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 come up with these ideas and they kind of work. So yeah, yeah. so this is quite funny. So Victoria said. Let's make um, a more modern style Chardonnay. So this is a Chardonnay that we vinify. So we have two tanks, they're literally here. So we make one tank, which is purely um, stainless steel, and then one tank, okay, sure, hang on. Hold, hold the force for one, one second, I'm gonna get it. Um, I'm gonna come back in a second. Oh. So we have essentially the old cellar on this side with the um, cement tanks that you can see in the back. And we've got the new cellar on that side with all the, most of the stainless steel tanks. A couple we've still got here. All right, I'm back. So the thing about the show, so this is, so you know how you can oak wines in barrels. And so we use these new oak barrels from the Ice Gamma Thieven. Sure, it's half the price of a burgundy, but still for the South France, it's still a relatively expensive wine, but it's, it's beautiful. Then if you want to oak a wine, there's many other ways. You can use chips, like which are basically 10 kilo tea bags with small, small chips. And you put them in the tank and within a month, your wine will be a little bit oaky. It's not great to be honest and it's not very elegant and apart from the oak flavor there's also you know the exchange between air throughout the the, the oak which will enhance the the micro oxygenation and makes the wine a lot more complex but so you have the chips and you have the barrel but in between they found that something which is called a stave so basically this is like a slat so it's called a stave stave is like what they call it in French a dwell. It's, it's, it's the plank of an oak barrel. And so what we've done with Victoria is the, 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 the Chardonnay is we've made one tank pure Chardonnay and one tank that we vinified with these oak staves. So this is a piece of wood, exactly the same oak that is used for making these barrels. It is, as you can see, it's brown, so it, it's been heated and toasted. So it will have the, the, the oaky flavor and the vanilla and a little bit, yeah, the, the pangalie and so. Um, so it's like, it's, so when you're talking chips, this is like way, way above it. So it also from a cost perspective, it's, it's, it's a lot more expensive, but it's kind of an in-between house between chips and, and, and a proper oak barrel. And, it's quite interesting. So it will give a really quite a, a nice oak flavor um, because we actually use it 
in the tank while we vinified it, vinify the wine. So it's not just to mature to oak and to give it some flavor. No. So the wine is vinified with these staves. So these are in the in these stainless steel fermentation tank. And it, it I find it it's it's a really so we've been doing this for oh, six, seven years now. And so Vicky, my darling bride, um, she she wanted to make this blend of Chardonnay with a lot of fruit on one side and a lot of oak flavors on the other side. They're really kind of a mix, but not over oak. So it's 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 well well proportioned. And she wanted to make a more modern style Chardonnay because she is New Zealander and she wanted to kind of marry her New Zealand roots with her her French French um, um, life. And and so we did that and. Seriously, it, it is the single biggest selling wine we have. I mean, I kid you not, we sell 150,000 bottles of this Chardonnay. It's crazy. Oh. It's crazy. Got, a, got a silver medal in, in Paris. And because it's only silver, but to be honest, it's, it's an IGP Pays Doc. And to get a medal in the Pays Doc category, which is the biggest category in, in France, it's the biggest single wine producing area in France. To get a medal there is, is, is kind of cool. So yeah, I'm pretty proud of my, uh, my, my, my Victoria. So not just Victoria's favorite. <laughs> She's my favorite of many, many others. Uh, that this particular wine, if it sells that much. Indeed. Um, Indeed. All right. And Colette had a question and I've, Colette, I'm, you might be talking about a different vintage because you're asking about the difference between the, uh, the uh, rosé of um, of Charlotte and the rosé of of Doe of, of um, Oliver, mm. and can you compare and contrast for us, uh, Floris and Charlotte? Sure. So, so the the, the rosé de Mendo is uh, is Senso. So Senso is really big, juicy um, grapes. Uh, they they sometimes make red from it, but I actually don't find it very interesting because I don't like the concentration, but. What it, what is work? It was a little bit collateral damage when we bought the vineyard. We were very focused on Chardonnay and Pinot, and um, and then we had this small. So when we bought bought the domain, we had a small vineyard of Senso, and we didn't really really know what to do with it. So we said, let's try and make it into rosé, and it's quite worked out really really well because because they're big big berries, so they have a lot of juice. Because we are at such a high altitude, they keep their their acidity, and um, and it's 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 very light color, so very pale, very fruity, not very heavy. It's it's a really um, I have to say it's really good. Um, I really do enjoy this also. It's very it's very different. You don't have well your rosé is is is, is Syrah, right? So it's, exactly, it's, but you get a lot more Syrah rosé than also, and that's it's got a bit of a special. Maybe I'm just being nice to my brother, but it does. There's something <laughs> um, very catchy about the France Rosé that it's hard to put your gloves down. That's true. Mm. <laughs> and and guys, so Barb is asking uh, if you had to pick one red from this cellar, what would you pick? Ha! Huh. Favorite child, please. Ah. Huh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's hard because um, it's like telling yeah, exactly favorite child. Uh, okay, sure. He, he, he was in the film at all. What, what, what would be your oh. he read? Yeah. I personally really enjoy the Merlot right. in the Flower Charlotte. It's nice. In the right. I mean, the nice thing about the Merlot is that so part of the Merlot is so as I said earlier, is that we, we, we buy some grapes for, for the Fleur de Charlotte range, which um, allows us to, to seek different terroir and different areas. But That's part of the, the, the fun in it as well, is that you can really kind of cherry pick mm. um, what the vineyards that you think will suit best for what you want to create. And for us, that is, like you said, the fruit and it's bringing out the, the best of every, um, of every cepage. And um, for that being able to kind of adapt and also explore the terroir and explore the region and play around with it is, is fun because you can bring the best out from different areas. Um, 
So and I'm going to make it easy for you, Floris, because uh, they're in, they're, they're you get them both in the same uh, case. Okay. So and so and I'm I, actually I'm going to open both tonight. Um, yeah. So we're having a, uh, I think we're having chicken on the barbie, right? We're having a late dinner. Yeah. But um, so I'm going to open both tonight. So I'm not to say I can't make a choice. All right. So the Chapelle de Grenache, um, which we have switched. I'm not sure which vintages you have, Michael, but so last three vintages already, we've switched uh, 100 The 18 in Chapelle, and I've got the 11 in Evangel. Okay, so the 11 in Evangel will still be a traditional vinification where we would have put the grapes in a tank and pushed them down um, by feet and stuff like that, but we completely switched for those wines to carbonic maceration to really have that intercellular um, uh, maceration that kind of destroys the cell structure and, and, and extracts an enormous amount of flavor. Um, so it's a complicated way of making it, but it, it's really enhanced the, the concentration. So I, there's no, it's difficult. I think tonight um, we're going to have the Chapelle, mm -hmm. which is an extremely concentrated Grenache um, with no oak, it's probably close to 16% alcohol, which always gets me into trouble with the LCBO or someone <laughs> rather. Um, yeah. but, um, but I have to say, it is 16%, um, but the Chapelle, I think, is my favorite red wine uh, from Canet because it's so, it, you, don't, you don't taste the 16%, as terrible as that sounds. Um, it's it just you taste it. It tastes like you a fruit bomb. You taste it. You taste it in the end of the it's a, yeah. It balances right. That that the alcohol yeah, yeah, exactly. isn't evident. It's uh, exactly. yeah. It's and that's balanced. it's the, the the art of the the wine making. You know, you make you you bring out the flavor and make such a strong wine. Really, completely enjoyable. Um, and for me, I really enjoy that. I think it's a it's a great fruit. So we're gonna have we are gonna have the chapelle with our chicken, which we're gonna serve because it's hot still here, and so we're gonna we're gonna probably even chuck it in an ice bucket and serve. You shouldn't drink it more than than eighteen nineteen degrees because with the heat the alcohol comes out and it just knocks you over the head. So that's gonna be for our chicken, and then uh, I know there you guys went to the market this morning in Carcassonne and. Uh, we're going to have a few cheeses and then that little bit of oakiness of the Syrah of Les Evangiles is going to end my evening in a rather nice fashion. Sounds brilliant. I'll be right over. And to answer to, to Barb, I would say I would recommend this Chateau Canet Minervois mm -hmm. because this is the classic. And, is, is. And, and, and just so you know, it also scored highly in the tasting. I've been really? having, I've been every year I'm buying this. And this year, Michael, I'm going to try the Magnum. Oh, yes. We're doing it in Magnum as well. And and um, I think you've heard, Floris, that I've started collecting Magnums. So I'll be having to add that. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah, that. It'll, it'll be uh, into the cellar. And, 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 and we've also talked about that I'm buying these every year so that I can do verticals. And they're, they're aging beautifully. That 2011... Uh, I don't know if you remember, but I brought it back from when I was visiting you in May. So, that's, uh, so that that's great. And and now I see that Brendan's back. So before he disappears on us again, he was asking if Charlotte was planning to do to to move from from that uh, the the series that you're doing now. Are you planning anything else in the future? Ooh, that's exciting. Actually, well, on the back of um, of Antarctica. Um, you know, adding a little pinch of sustainability where we can. Um, nothing is concrete yet or you know, in discussion modes and exciting to think about what is to come next. Um, but I think you know, maybe doing something a bit more playful with the wines, but also with packaging or adding a touch of, of how would you say, Switch it up a bit, you know. Panache. Panache, not the classic. Well, there's also there's also the, 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 the plan, which is, you know. Uh, so we bought the vineyards in, in Limoux a couple of years ago with Oliver, and, and we are we are looking to, to continue to expand our, our vineyard holdings in, in, in different and especially complementary uh, areas 
close to us, um, small Appalachians, exciting little stuff where we can... The potential to... to develop. Yeah, exactly. Um, and explore and see what that little nugget of land would have to, to give and see how we can make the most of that. Wonderful. And, you know, we try and keep these to an hour. We're just a little over and we know that you guys haven't had dinner yet. And I did want to tell everybody, I've actually gotten a whole bunch of private messages that a lot of people on the call have visited you guys. And invariably, if they've had a wonderful experience, as we did, 31 of us came to see you this past May. And I just have two very quick pictures to show that I'm going to share with the group. Awesome. And, and the first one, everybody will, will recognize because... It's the same two that are uh, that were cavorting in the uh, in the cellar before. <laughs> so there they are. That we we arrived to find them playing in the grass. They did we... the new brand of dogs, the new race of dogs. They, they use some people know them as wine maranas, but these are actually wine maranas. Wine maranas, good. And and if I recall, way way back, you told me a story that you let them tell you when the grapes are ready for picking because they well, they'll uh, only eat them when they're when ready we go, when we go on walks we snack on the grapes but the dogs won't eat the grapes until like probably the, just before the harvest and Which, if they eat the grapes then you know they yeah. are better get them off the vine yeah. and then this this was the, the 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 barbecue that was being set up for us and by the time we were ready to eat those two tables, and if I don't, I'm, I recall even more food, or maybe it was just, it was just an amazing uh, way that you presented to us. We so appreciated it, and we had such a good time, and we will definitely plan to come back again. Uh, probably not in 23, but probably 24, we'll do France again with... Uh, you have the members. donkey, you have the donkey yes. in the back. Charlotte what's learned to, what's uh, that about? So that's that Charlotte learned to ride her horse. She's, a, she's an avid polo player, and that's what she learned, learned to ride on. Ah, okay. And will will you soon be playing for France, Charlotte? Oh, definitely. I don't think Charlotte. I don't think France is a polo team. Is it? No. no. <laughs> yes. Um. But yes, I did learn how to ride on the donkey. Well, that's terrific. Thank you both so very much for joining us and uh, and talking so passionately about your wine and and your your expedition was amazing. Thank you all to all of the uh, Opinion members for joining us. Um, really, really appreciate. Uh, you're coming out for these. It's been a while since we've done one, so I'm really glad to see that they're they've been very popular and and they continue to be so. And uh, Kim Chen, thank you for running the board. We really appreciate that taking some time on your Saturday afternoon. And yes, that's a great idea. Cheers to everybody. Cheers, Flores. Cheers, Charlotte. Enjoy your your rest of your night and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. I'm going for a swim in the pool. It's awfully hot here in Kitchener Waterloo. Okay. Enjoy, guys. Love to see you, everybody. Bye. Love to see Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.